thank you all for being here today, and thank you for that incredibly warm welcome. And, and I bring greetings from New Jersey, a state that up till 2009 hadn't elected a Republican statewide in 12 years, still hasn't elected a Republican to the United States Senate since 1972, has 700,000 more registered Democrats than Republicans, and suffered through the governorships of Jim McGreevy and John Corzine. But today is a state that is leading the way in this country to show that government can be put back under control and work for the people that it's supposed to be working for again. And how did it happen? Uh, here's how it happened. When we got there in January 2010, I was told by John Corzine during the transition, don't worry about the fiscal 10 budget, it's on a glide path. <laughs> well, what happened when I got there was in my first week in office, the state treasurer and the chief of staff came to me and said, if you don't cut $2 billion in spending in the next six weeks, we won't make payroll for the second pay period of March. So in other words, John Corzine's definition of a glide path is landed about $2 billion short of the runway. <laughs> and so we had two choices as to what to do. First choice was to sit down with my Democratic legislature, negotiate with them a package of uh, spending cuts and tax increases that would close that budget gap and move on. Second choice was to sit down with the lieutenant governor in my office and go through all 2,400 line items in the budget and cut $2.2 billion in spending from the budget through executive order, not having to involve the legislature at all. Now, for those of you who've been watching me in New Jersey for any period of time, if you believe I chose the first option, <laughs> you need to leave right now. We chose option number two, and it wasn't easy. You know, think about it. 60% of the fiscal year was over. 60% of the money was already out the door. And so $2.2 billion was a lot of money, but we said in a state like New Jersey, they could not afford any more tax increases. We had to start making the tough choices. So I went in, I made the cuts, I signed the executive order, and I asked for a speech before the joint session to let them know what I was going to do. And they asked me for a copy of the speech before, and I said, no, nah, I don't do that. You show up, I'll let you know what I'm going to say. <laughs> and so, and so it was about a 40-minute speech, but I'll boil it down to 30 seconds for you, which may be what I should have done in the first place. Here's pretty much what I said. You created this problem. You lied to the people about it and left it to me to fix. I just sat in my office and cut $2.2 billion by executive order I fixed your problem. You can thank me later. Have a nice day. <laughs> now, you can hardly imagine, I left the floor of the legislature, and the press swarmed down the floor to talk to the legislators, and they'd never seen anything like this before. And you can imagine, they were calling me all kinds of names. Napoleon Bonaparte, Julius Caesar, all these great leaders of the past I admire so much. <laughs> and the next day, and the next day, I saw the, the Senate president, the Democratic Senate president. We were walking in the building together, and, and he's, a, he's a good guy, and we've done a lot of good things together. Um, but that day, he had said all those nasty things about me in the newspaper. So the way in, I said to him, hey, Steve, you know, um, you made me think about it. And maybe I'll go upstairs and vacate that executive order and, and, uh, and let you guys fix the problem. I'll send it down the hall. And this is all you need to know about politics in New Jersey. He looked at me and said, hey, hey Governor, don't overreact. <laughs> well, crazy on us now. And so we moved on to the fiscal year 11 budget, which had a projected $11 billion budget deficit on a $29 billion budget. A 37% deficit by percentage, the highest deficit of any state in America. And you know what? the folks in the legislature wanted to do. They wanted to raise taxes, of course, and in fact, they wanted to put a millionaire surcharge on, an extra 
point and three quarters on top of the top rate, which was already the third highest top rate in America. And let me just explain quickly about the millionaire's tax in New Jersey, because we already had one. But it's special New Jersey math. And I had to learn this when I got there. You see, <laughs> the millionaire's tax in New Jersey applies to businesses and individuals who make income over $400,000 a year. <laughs> now, when you become governor and inherit that kind of tax structure, you're trying to sell your state, it's sometimes difficult to figure it out. But I figured it out. I went around the country and I said, listen, if you're not a millionaire, but you'd like to feel like one. <laughs> Come to New Jersey. You're not a millionaire, but we'll tax you like one. And now they wanted to add a point three quarter on top of that. And I said to them, listen, I'm not going to sign it. And they said, if you don't sign it, we're closing down the government. Now, this had been done before. In 2006, they had closed the government with John Corzine as the governor. But in a way that only Democrats could, of course, they closed the government because they couldn't agree on how much to raise the sales tax. <laughs> and so they closed down the government. And John Corzine very famously said, called the press into his office, now my office, and he put a cot in there. And he said, I'm going to sleep on that cot until this crisis is resolved. <laughs> so I knew these were the same characters, you know who had done that with him four years earlier. So I had to make sure they understood that we were under new management. So I said, listen, you pass the tax, I'm going to veto it. You don't send me a budget, then close down the government, that's fine. But i got to tell you one thing. I'm not moving any damn cot into this office and sleeping here. <laughs> if you do it, I'm going to get into the black SUVs, I'm going to go to the governor's residence, I'm going to go upstairs, I'm going to order a pizza, I'm going to open a beer, and I'm going to watch the Mets. And you can call me back when you open the government, but until then, you are on your own. And, and they said, what about shared sacrifice, Governor? You're always talking about shared sacrifice. They said, it is shared sacrifice. I'm watching the Mets. It's shared sacrifice. So they passed that. That tax increase, they brought it right down, they walked it down to my office to give it to hand, deliver it to me. And I said, here, wait one second, just stay right there. I don't want you to waste any time. See, I'm just going to get this pen out of my pocket. I'm going to veto it right now and send it back to you, because we're not raising taxes in New Jersey, not on my watch. And they had to understand that. So what happened? What happened to that budget that was dead on arrival? They passed that budget with 99.8% of the line items, exactly as I'd sent them in March. The lesson is this, everybody. Leadership matters. Standing for your principles matters. Then we moved on to the problem that everybody told me I shouldn't go anywhere near. Pensions and benefits public pensions and public health benefits for public employees. Now, you know, some of you, I'm sure, in this group um, have watched some of my more interesting interactions with the teachers' union <laughs> on YouTube or on television. They turn the lights on. Is the union here? <laughs> Good news for me is both my troopers are still here, too. So we're, <laughs> we're doing all right. Stay alert, boys. Um, <laughs> you know, we had to deal with this problem. Here's why. When I became governor, New Jersey's public pension system was $54 billion underfunded. $54 billion underfunded. But it looked robust compared to our public worker health insurance system, which was $67 billion underfunded. 121 billion. The state's budget was only 29 billion dollars a year. That would be four years of doing nothing but closing that gap. We had to change the system. And so folks said to me, you know, you can't take this on though. Same things they say in Washington, D.C. now. It's the third rail of politics. You can't talk about it because public pensions and public health systems, like for our public workers, are the equivalent of Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security on the federal level. It's the same thing. But I said, there is no way the people of New Jersey elected me to ignore this problem. 
And so what did we do? We came out in September of 2010 with a plan that was very direct and very simple and very effective. It said on the pension side, you have to raise the retirement age. You have to increase the contributions that are being paid by the public employees into their pension system. You have to have larger penalties for early retirement, kick part-timers out of the system, and lastly, eliminate cost of living adjustments every year until these funds are solvent. Now, sound like a solution for some other problems on the federal level, right? And they said you couldn't do it. So, and on the health care side, you know, the overwhelming majority of public workers, when I became governor, paid nothing, zero, for their health insurance, for family coverage from the day they were hired until the day they died. All I said was, I want them to have health insurance coverage, absolutely. Pay your fair share. Pay a percentage of the premiums so you have skin in the game. You pick a plan that you need and afford, and you pay part of it, and we'll pay part of it too, but not pay all of it anymore. Now, maybe one of the small tactical decisions I made that, looking back on it, may not have been the best one, was I decided to announce this at the firefighters convention in Wildwood, New Jersey. <laughs> 4,000 firefighters on a Friday afternoon on the boardwalk in aptly named Wildwood. Um, well, when they introduced me, uh, I was heartily booed by these firefighters and I came up to the podium and stood behind a podium like this and they were booing and I went like this, and they booed some more. Then I leaned into the microphone and said, come on, you can do better than that. And they did. And finally, I, I eliminated the speech that I was going to give, and I basically told them this. So listen, I understand that you feel like you've been lied to and betrayed, and you're scared. And you have every reason to be scared, because you have been lied to and betrayed. You've been lied to and betrayed by every governor, Republican and Democrat, who's come in here for the last 20 years and told you you could get something for nothing, and that they were going to do it for you, when they had no idea how they were going to pay for it. And so you're right to feel scared, and you're right to be angry, and you're right to feel like you've been lied to and betrayed, because you have been. But here's what I don't get. Why are you booing the first guy to come in this room and tell you the truth? Because there's no political upside for me coming in here and telling you I'm going to make you pay more for what you get. But here's the thing. You can boo me now all you want. But when I get this done, 10 years from now, when you retire, you're going to be looking for my address on the internet to send me a thank you note because you're going to have a pension and you're going to have health care. It's time for us to tell the truth to people, not to keep lying to them and tell them what they want to hear. Now, so, so how do we pass it? How do you pass it with a Democratic legislature? Well, here's how you do it. First, I had 30 town hall meetings from September to June all around my state just talking about this issue, telling people why it was important to them and their future and their children's future, the future of our state. And then you have to build bridges with like-minded Democrats. Because in my state, with a Democratic legislature, all this would just be speeches if you didn't build those bridges. You gotta get in a room, and you gotta forge relationships, and you gotta make it happen, and so I did. And, and the Speaker of the Assembly, Sheila Oliver, and the Senate President, who I talked about before, Steve Sweeney, deserve great credit, because you know what they did? They posted those bills for a vote and voted for themselves in their, in their chambers when only one-third of their caucuses supported it. One-third of the Democrats and all the Republicans. Now, that's what we have to do to make our country better, too. Now, I've always said that there is a boulevard that exists between compromising your principles and getting everything you want. Now, we should never compromise our principles, and I never have. Those are the things that people vote for you on. That's the core of who you are. But there's always a boulevard between that and getting everything you want. Sometimes it's narrow. Sometimes it's broader. The job of a leader, the job of a governor, the job of a president is to get the people in the room 
and to bang enough heads together and rub enough arms and cajole enough to have them put the country's and the state's greater interest ahead of their own personal partisan interest. That's what we did in New Jersey, and that's the model for America. And we got it done. And by the way, here's the price tag. Because we got it done, because we stood by our principles, because we did the right thing, that is going to save the taxpayers of New Jersey $132 billion over the next 30 years. And it's going to make those funds solvent again for the people who are counting on them, the police officers, the firefighters, the teachers, who are counting on those things to retire. That's what leadership can provide to you. Now, when I landed here today in Chicago, uh, I stopped in the airport for a minute because I saw the president was going to come on the air to talk about the economy. <laughs> and I said, well, what the heck, I got 10 minutes to waste, why not? <laughs> but, you know, surprisingly, it turned out not to be a waste. And here's why. Because I heard the president say something today that is one of the core differences between who we are and what he represents for America. He was talking about why job growth hasn't been as robust as it should be. And this is what he said. I mean, I had to stand there and stare at the TV. I can't believe he said it. He said, one of the reasons is because state and local government hiring is going in the wrong direction. <laughs> I swear to you, that's what he said just a couple hours ago. Now, in New Jersey, we have more government workers per square mile than any state in America. <laughs> but since I've been governor, we now have fewer people on the state payroll than at any time since Christy Whitman left office in January of 2001. That's the right direction, Mr. President, not the wrong direction. <laughs> the President the president fundamentally believes that the way to support our economy is to take more in taxes from all of you and spend it on more public workers who then will pay a fraction of that money back in taxes. If anybody ran a business like that, they would be out of business quickly, and Barack Obama's leadership is driving this business, the United States of America, towards a fiscal cliff. We better stand together in the next five months and stop him from doing it. It is, it is an outrage to have the President of the United States stand up and say to hardworking governors, Republicans and Democrats around this country, that state and local government hiring is moving in the wrong direction. And we're to blame because the economy's not growing. He's the one who put forward an ineffective, wasteful stimulus plan that did nothing to help this economy. He's the one who saddled us with all these federal rules and regulations that don't allow governors to have the freedom to do what we really want. And then he has the audacity to stand up this morning and say that it's the nation's governors and the nation's mayors who are driving our economy down by not hiring enough people for government work. If you need to understand with any more clarity the difference between conservative Republican principles and this president, you don't need to listen to one more word in this campaign than what he said behind that podium at the White House today. And let me tell you this, I tell my staff this all the time. Campaigns are about tactics and about speeches and about who can articulate things better and who raises the most money. But let me tell you what is always the most powerful thing. I remind my staff of this every day and I want to remind all of you today. The most powerful thing on our side is this. We're right, and they're wrong. So, so let's not make it any more complicated, because in New Jersey, we've now capped property taxes. 
We've capped the interest arbitration awards that go to public sector workers at the same level so that we can control these property taxes. We've reformed our pension and benefit system. We balanced two budgets and a half with the one Corzine left me and the third one coming up this year. And imagine this, when I stood behind the podium the night I was elected governor, I said I was going down there to turn Trenton upside down. And people didn't know what the heck that meant. Well, let me tell you what it means. Because this January, I proposed a 10% across the board income tax cut for the people of New Jersey. And guess what's happening? The very same Democrats in the legislature who raised taxes and fees in New Jersey 115 times in the eight years before I became governor. Just so you understand the scope of that, that means they raised the state tax or fee every 25 days for eight years. Every 25 days, they stuck their hand in the pockets of the citizens of New Jersey and took more money out for their ideas, their schemes, their bigger government. Now, what's happened now? We're no longer having an argument with a majority of the government in Trenton about whether to cut taxes. They're now just arguing with me about how to cut taxes. I believe we'll have a tax cut in New Jersey by June 30th. So if you want to know what an upside down Trenton looks like, it's that. Trenton has been turned upside down. We're cutting taxes. So, you know, if we could do it here in New Jersey, I mean, really, I don't want to hear any excuses from anybody. Yeah, I know about Illinois, let me tell you. You know, listen, my condolences. Well, I, you know, when I was U.S. Attorney, for seven years in New Jersey, people used to ask me, is New Jersey the most corrupt state in America? And I used to say, no, 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 listen. I said, before I go to bed at night, when I hit my knees and say my prayers, I thank God for Illinois and Louisiana. Because <laughs> as long as they're in the union, we'll never be number one. And now that I've converted to become governor, People say to me, is New Jersey the worst tax state in America? And I say, oh no. <laughs> Every night, I hit my knees and thank God for Governor Quinn and Governor Brown of California. Because as long as they're in charge, we won't be number one anymore. I want to end on a serious note. You know. Our country is at a moment of enormous crisis, enormous crisis. We see what's happening in Europe. Europe is doing us a favor, everybody. They're giving us a preview. Preview of what is going to come across the Atlantic Ocean if we don't start taking the steps that are necessary to fix it. Now, every generation in American history is judged. They're judged by the people who come after them. And you know, just this past week, it was the 68th anniversary of the storming in Normandy Beach by the folks who historians have now called the greatest generation. And they called them the greatest generation because they earned it, because they put their lives, their honor, their treasure on the line to save liberty and freedom as we know it. And all of us in this room owe an enormous debt to that generation and the generation who came after them, who built this into the greatest economy and the greatest freedom machine that the world has ever seen. And now we're at our moment of crisis. Maybe in some respects not as severe in terms of the feeling of the threat as World War II was, but threatening nonetheless to our children and grandchildren. And so how are we going to deal with this? When we're judged, are they going to say that when this moment of crisis came, we stuck our head in the sand, we surrounded ourselves with our creature comforts, and we said the problems are too big and we're too small, someone else is going to have to fix it? Or are we going to say that at this time of crisis, we stood for our principles? We stood up for freedom and liberty in this country and around the world. We were willing to make the difficult decisions that needed to be made in order to make our country great for our children and grandchildren and to make this century the second American century, not the beginning of the decline from the first American century. That's the stakes, everybody. 
And so here's my promise to you. If you are willing to stand up and fight for those things with me, I will fight for you. If you are willing to stand to be judged in that way by the generations that come after us, I'm willing to stand with you. But we must fight together over the next number of months to let everyone in America know that American greatness and its future is on the line and only telling people the truth and doing the hard things like we've done in New Jersey for America will ensure a second great American century. I want to leave that legacy to my children and grandchildren. I know you want to leave it to yours. Let's get to work, everybody. Thank you very much.